Amen. Good to have all of you tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. This whole row over here full of these young ladies. Isn't that good? All three that were saved are in here tonight. Amen. All three of them. Amen. Would you turn to the book of Jude with me, please? Jude. I only have one chapter, verse 1. Jude. Book of Jude. It's one of these real short books in the Bible. Last book before the book of Revelation. Jude verse 1. Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now note carefully verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless your holy word now. In thy righteous name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. As time passes and as you are conscious of it and should be now because 2019 uh, waits for us in just a few days. And a passing of another year. I've watched a lot of them pass since I've been on this globe. And, and the passing of time gets a hold of you. You realize that it's just going to keep moving right on unless someone comes and puts one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea and declares time to be no more. And there's only one that can do that. That's our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. But we are approaching 2019. What does it portend? What do we expect? What are we looking forward to? 2018 has uh, been quite an eventful year, no question about that. 2019 may be far more eventful. Nobody in this house to knows, nobody knows, nobody in this world knows except the Lord. He's the only one who knows what's coming. But I do believe this tonight, and I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. I believe you live in that generation that will have to contend for the faith. Yes, I do. I believe it's come upon us. I've watched it as it's developed since I've been here at Temple. We are in the midst of a great falling away, an apostasy. We are in it, folks. It's not coming. We're in it. It's happening right now, everywhere. And so we have to contend for the faith, the truth. And the Apostle James, Jude here rather, called it the common salvation not common in the sense that it belittles its effectiveness and its importance, but common in the sense that there's only one salvation, there's only one name given under men, uh, under heaven, whereby we must be saved, and that's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to quote some stuff for you tonight that some of the apostates are saying now. And here's the thing. People have always believed. There's, not a new, there's nothing new about any of this. What is new, they're in your face with it now. And it is beginning to take hold in mainline denominations. And a lot of people are embracing this and they're falling away. And the Bible says that there would come a falling away. And the scripture says they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables. And so it says for, for us to watch thou in all things. And I would be, re, I would be uh, remiss if I did not tell you tonight and warn you of what to look for. Because I'm a pastor and that's my responsibility. Uh, the evangelist has his place, the missionary has his place, the pastor has his place. We all complement each other. But it's my responsibility as a pastor of a local assembly to keep you up with what's going on. I want to read a quote for you tonight. Conventional comforting Christianity has failed. It does not work. For the churches that insist on preaching it, the gig is up. Now, if I understand correctly, a gig is where someone has a, a, a performance and they have a run and they're a week or two or whatever. So it's about a performance. 
And this writer says the gig is up. We cannot go back and we should not want to. In earlier American, American awakenings, preachers extolled old-time religion as the answer to questions about God, morality, and existence. This awakening is different. It is not about sawdust trails, mortification of sin, putting to death the old man, and being washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's not about that. The awakening going on around us is not an evangelical revival. It is not returning to the faith of our fathers or recreating our grandparents' church. Now watch this carefully. Instead, it is a great returning to ancient understandings of the human quest for the divine. This woman who wrote this book rejects the blood and she re rejects the cross. And obviously, from what you heard me read for you tonight, she is no Christian. She is not your sister in Christ. Although she may tell you that she loves Jesus and she may tell you that she talks about the Lord Jesus and prays to him and all of that, that's meaningless, folks. I know, you say, well, now, preacher, who are you to judge? We have to judge. He that, is, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. It's a responsibility to judge. And it's, the scripture says to try the spirits. So I'm going to try them tonight. Amen. We have to be very careful with this stuff. Anybody that attacks the blood and the cross have attacked the very foundation of Christianity. The blood and the cross. I mean, notice, notice carefully. That's what they attack. Why do they attack that? Because it's satanic. Why do they attack it? Because there's power in the cross and there's power in the blood. Now, this lady gave her testimony. She read this, and now here's her testimony. I want to read this testimony for you about this lady who read what this woman wrote in her book. Listen to this. Here's what she says. She says, all I know is that 40 years ago, I was standing on a bridge ready to jump off when a voice spoke to me and said, you need to get saved. And I did that night. And my life has never been the same. I was walking in one direction and I turned around and started walking in the other. No one will ever convince me that Jesus is not the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by him. These people can say what they wish, but they will never see heaven or spend eternity with the Lord. Unless they repent and humble themselves and turn to him once again, he waits for them. I know that lady. I've never met her, but that's my sister. Yeah. Yeah, that's my family. This one that wrote the book up here, she's as much a stranger to me as somebody I've never seen in my life. But this lady right here, we're in the same family. We're in the same family. She's my sister. She knows the same Lord I know. Another one wrote about the same book. Wow. This is an eye opener. The cross and blood are the heart and backbone of Christianity. Amen. Amen. So we're going to con it's a confrontation now. We have to stand. We have must we must contend for the faith. You've got to stand, folks. You're going to have to stand for the truth. And um, if you don't stand for the truth, it may be because there's no truth in you. You know, if you won't, uh, if you won't, uh, if you won't stand for the light, maybe you're still in darkness. What, are the, what else would you live for if you didn't live for the Lord Jesus Christ? If you won't contend for the faith, it's quite remarkable too that what some of the leading religious people in this country—these are the big, big names in the emerging church. Listen to what they say about this woman's book. Now, listen to this. She spot on, prophetic, compelling, and most important, hopeful. Another one says, join her in rebuilding religion from the bottom up. Another one says, she has a good nose to sniff out religion, but she also has the eyes to see new life budding from the compost of Christendom. How do you know what a compost is? Okay. This woman has, been, has, has keen eye for what is happening in the Christian world. So keen. 
She is able to see through the bad news for the good news that is emerging. You mean to tell me the cross of Christ and the blood is not good news? Amen. You see, we don't think alike. As one of our foremost commentators on 21st, 21st century Christianity. And then finally, this one says, I expect and hope that this will be the must-read church book for every Christian leader, clergy and lay, for years to come. Wait a minute. A must-read church book for every Christian leader, clergy and lay, for years to come? No, it won't be. I wouldn't put that garbage. That's pure, unadulterated garbage. Amen. It's sad, though. <coughs> Because these people right here are the, the ones who are writing the books, giving the speeches, and leading mega churches. And they, and they, they endorse a book that says do away with the blood of the Lamb and do away with the cross of Christ. They endorse a book that says the gig is up. I'm not acting. Are you acting? I didn't sign on for a week. This is eternal. This is from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Earnestly contend for the faith. Here's what they say. Doctrine stands in the way of unity. Unity is what's important with these people. Another one says, The only way the world is going to see Jesus, Now listen to this. The only way the world is going to see Jesus is if all things and every person identifying as Christian unify. That's insanity. That's insane. There is no way that I can join up with that crowd. No way. You see, I was standing on that bridge next to that woman. I had a different bridge and a different location. She was ready to jump because she'd come to the end of her road. And she got saved. Same here. When I was 27, I'd come to the end of my road too. And I met him. And I met the one who can change your life. And he turned me around completely. The problem with these people is that they've got a head full of religion, folks. But they've never met the Lord. They don't know him. They don't know him. Why bother even listening to somebody like that? For the only reason I'm giving it to you tonight is to warn you that if this stuff comes around through your family, you may have a family member that says, Hey, I've got a book. This thing's wonderful. I want you to read this. Oh, it's helped me so much. There's the issue. There's the issue. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 17 says this. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. The Apostle Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The Apostle Paul preached the cross. That's an entirely different message in itself. What does that mean? The cross is the place where Christ died to this world, where God reconciled the world unto himself, and the cross is where I died to the world. And the cross is the great dividing line between the world and the saved. The cross. They can't cross that cross. That's there and before them and they can't do a thing with it. They either embrace it or it stops them dead in their tracks. Because that cross is what identifies us. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is where man was justified on the cross at Calvary. And the cross at Christ is where the blood was shed. And the blood that washes our sins away. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Sure, it's foolish to this woman. It's foolish to these people. So what do they preach? They preach social reform. They preach personal spirituality. They preach enlightenment. But they don't preach salvation. They don't preach the new birth. But they're big on enlightenment. They're big on learning the secrets of the spirit world and how that you can tap into energies that can enhance your life and make you so great on this earth. And you can get what you want once you learn the secrets. You're one of the initiates. That's what they preach. That's what they're teaching people. 
Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 12. Galatians 6, 12. The scripture says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. You see, circumcision and the cross don't go together. The cross represents death. Somebody had to die. And if there's a cross in your life, you're going to die. The old man has to be crucified. That's right. The old man must be crucified. I'll reform the old man, preacher. No, you won't. You can't reform him. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You can't reform the old man. The only thing you can do is crucify him. And you may have to do it on an hourly basis, a daily basis, but you've got to crucify the flesh with the affection and lust thereof. Amen. That's all you can do with it. The flesh, there's nothing that will ever come good from the flesh. And that includes your fleshly mind. So the, the apostle said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The Bible said, renew your mind. You have to do that. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 12. The apostle Paul says, they want to make a fair show in the flesh. Verse 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. Amen. Amen. That's why they hate the Apostle Paul, because he preached the cross. He didn't preach morality and self-righteousness. He preached the cross. He did. He preached the blood. He preached the cross. And that's why they hated him and still hate him. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. All of the charges that Satan could bring against you and me, and he did, believe me, he brought them all. He brought all the charges against us that condemned us. The Lord Jesus Christ took every one of those charges and he nailed it to the cross. <laughs> that's what the title is represented over the top of his head. This is Jesus of Nazareth as king of the Jews. The title is represented what he'd done, his, his, his crimes. And so all that Satan could accuse you of was nailed to the cross. Hallelujah to God. That gives me great comfort. Second Peter chapter number 2 and verse 18 says this, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. In other words, they are very eloquent in their speech. They know how to choose the words. They know how to impress. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge. This is the key to understanding this whole text. The knowledge. They've learned something. There's light that has entered their soul. For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this woman says, we don't want the cross. We don't want the blood. All right? She's got knowledge of it, folks. You'd be surprised how many people on this earth have never heard of the cross. They've never heard of the blood. They don't know anything about that. Yet this woman has made a conscious decision. I don't want the blood and I don't want the cross. The gig is up. All right, the Bible defines her right here. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. 
Isn't that something? That's scary. That's, you know, you... If you choose to be an apostate, there's a price to pay. There's a price, a heavy price. And the Apostle Peter doesn't pull any punches here. He lays it on the line. And he says to you, it has been better for them never to have known. Better off, never hearing. Isn't that sad? They say, well now, we need to get rid of the gender identity. Gender is an issue. All right. Why is gender an issue? And they come back and they say, we didn't need, we, somebody showed me a thing tonight, church in Sweden. They're trying to drop the masculine gender in reference to God. No longer he or him. What do they do? Is it either feminine or it? They go to the neuter. It. That's what happens with them. Then you get into this androgynous religion. Both male and female. And that's where they're taking people. They're already brainwashing people to accept gender identity, not from biological, from the biological makeup of the person, but from what they think in their mind. Where do you think that's going to lead people? God Almighty, every time He shows up in that Old Testament, it is the masculine gender. Every time the Lord Jesus Christ shows up in the New Testament, it is the masculine gender. Ever last time. Never. Is the Lord Jesus referred to in the feminine gender, nor is God the Father referred to in the feminine gender. But it didn't start here. If you go to the Sistine Chapel, walk in there where Michelangelo in the 1500s painted, folks, that's beautiful art. That's top of the line. Michelangelo was, Michelangelo was a gifted artist, period. But what you find up there is a representation of what the Bible teaches creation and all these stories in the book they're inside the Sistine Chapel but that's not all that's in there that's the problem well what else is in there the oracles the feminine oracles they're around the ceiling mixed in with the Bible representations oracles pagan oracles the oracle of Delphi she's in there the other oracles are in there so what did he do he gave respect. He paid respect for the knowledge and learning of the ancient Greeks, Romans, whatever their culture was involved with it. He gave respect to them. But why? Because the idea is that there is more than one line of inspiration. This is important. There is more than one manner that God has made himself known to mankind. So, at Constantinople, when Constantine went in there in 300 and something A.D., they changed the name of it from, from, uh, from Byzantium to Constantinople. Now, it's, now it is, is uh, 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 Istanbul. Yeah. And they've ch but when it was Constantinople, they built a church. Beautiful church. Beautiful. What did they call it? Hagia, which is holy, Hagias, the Greek word for holy is Hagias. Hagia Sophia. Is Sophia a masculine name or a feminine name? It's feminine, certainly. What's going on? Same thing, folks. It's the same thinking that was involved with Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel where you have a mixture of, of inspiration, see? You've got inspiration coming through the scriptures, but you've also got inspiration coming through the, po through the poets and through the prophets and the prophetesses and the oracles. In other words, God is speaking through more than one source. That's exactly what they're doing today. That's exactly what they're trying to do today. They're trying to have this, uh, this joining together of all the religions where all religions respect each other and say, well, now we have the revelation God's given us, but he's given you a revelation too, so you're our brother too, and then maybe we can find common ground somewhere and we'll have a dialogue and we'll get together and we'll talk about this and we'll see just exactly where the great spirit revelation is leading us. Here's the problem. The Lord Jesus Christ does not get on the stage with anybody. He's God, a very God. He doesn't take a second seat to anybody's religion. 
Well, now that, Preacher Lawson, is a dogmatic, narrow-minded attitude you're taking tonight. No, that's a Bible attitude. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God was in Christ, Buddha, Zoroastrian, the Hindu, millions of gods, and all the rest of them reconciling the world unto himself. No. He was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. One, Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's what Peter said at the gate called beautiful. Just one name. Just one name. You say, is that that important, preacher? Don't you think that faith tradition is important here in the culture that you're raised in? And as long as you do the best you can in your culture, you're going to be okay? No, I'm sorry. When it comes down to the issue of justification, when it comes down to redemption, when it comes down to the new birth, when it comes down to being washed in the blood of Christ, there's only one that can do that and there's only one name under heaven that you can be saved by. That's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Michelangelo would have done well if he left off the oracle of Delphi. If he had left out the pagan, but you see that's, that's not the way they think. That's not the way they think. This is why you have the womb at the Vatican and you've also got the, the, uh, the uh, 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 obelisk. You know, and you can get into all of what that means and it can, get very, it, it can get very lewd, believe me. But that's why they've got it over there. Because these people have embraced the idea that there is more, more than one source of inspiration. And this is exactly what this woman is saying in her book. And she's saying to give up this old-fashioned religion, the old-time religion, the old way, that now we're moving on. What do you mean moving on? Moving on to where? The idea that we're making good time, we are progressing. Where? Ask one, ask one of them sometime, where are you going? I don't know, but I'm making good time. <laughs> We've come a long way. I don't have a clue where we're headed, but we're, we're flat out making good time. That's sad, isn't it? I'm not going to give up what I was taught and who saved me. I'm not going to do it. Take it. I'll take it to, to, to my grave. I don't know how much time I've got left in this world, but by the grace of God, God gave me grace to fight this thing until I had draw the last breath in my body. That's what I intend to do. That's what I've settled I'm going to do. And if I get, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what they'll do. I have no idea. I don't know, I don't know the time code. I don't know the time. I have no idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord Jesus just showed up? It would be. It would be. If he just came, all of a sudden he came back. That would be wonderful. But whether he comes back and I go the way that everybody else has gone, I have no choice no matter. Fine with me. Whatever God chooses to do. I just want to make sure, make, I want to make sure and make certain that what I believe is the truth. And I believe the Bible, folks. Amen. I believe this book. And my life changed. I was ready to jump off of the bridge with that woman. My bridge didn't look like her bridge, but I was on the bridge. And God saved my soul. Yes. Isn't that something? I saw a thing a couple of days ago. Have you ever seen the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco? It's a beautiful thing, folks. The fact of the matter is, the way San Francisco sits in that bay, that's a beautiful thing. San Francisco's a beautiful city. You've got these steep, you know, the steep inclines on their streets and all that. But they got a bad reputation because of what's been going on over there sexually in San Francisco. But did you know that that bridge right there, that Golden Gate Bridge, is the number one suicide spot in this country? The Golden Gate Bridge. Number one suicide spot in America. Uh, I, I forget what I was watching, but something about some kind of a troll. They're, ha they're, they're having... They've got some kind of a patrol they've set up to, to watch, you know, to try to cut down on the suicides, which is a good thing. Isn't that sad? Did you know there's a place in, in uh, Tokyo? How many know where Mount Fuji? You know the Mount Fuji? Okay. You can always tell you're in Japan because Mount Fuji's got a white cap top, about like this, you know. Classic, classic mountain. There's Mount Fuji. There's Japan. There's Tokyo. There's a forest up there, there's a forest up there around Mount Fuji that people go to, the Japanese people, they go to it all the time and they commit suicide in that forest. It's one of the most notorious places in the East 
for suicide. Many of them will leave a note. Many of them, don't, they don't leave a note. They just wander out into that forest. Did you know that the number one religion in Japan is not Buddhism in the sense that, that we understand. It's, it's a form of Buddhism. But really the number one religion in, in Japan is ancestor worship. Ancestor worship. Yeah, ancestor worship. I was watching a thing the other day. I know, I watch the thing, I watch the thing, I watch the thing. <laughs> I watch the most boring stuff in the world for most people. It doesn't bore me. You can take me and drop me off at a museum and come back a week later and get me. I'll be fine. <laughs> no problem. I'd love to see the British Museum. I'd love to see the Louvre in France. Anyway, when you, uh, these people, they show a little fishing village. And, and the people, it's the Japanese people. They're different people. They're clean people. And, uh, but they have little shrines. Little shrines everywhere you go. You walk down the street, here's another little shrine. A little further, here's a little shrine. And they'll walk along and they'll get in front of that shrine, that shrine and they'll, they'll pray, you know. And then they'll walk on and they'll pray some more. Very religious people, folks. Very religious. Gospel's been preached to them. We have two young people here that we support. He's a Japanese and she's, she, I think she's from Georgia or Alabama or somewhere. And, and they got married and they're going back to Japan and they're going back as missionaries. And they're going to go over there and preach the word. That's a good thing, don't you think? There's probably an awful lot of Japanese people, folks, that have never heard about the blood. And they've never heard about the cross. See what I mean? They don't fit here in Peter. It's this woman that's writing her book. She fits right here in Peter. She's heard about the blood. She's heard about the cross. She's heard about Christ. And she's rejected him. That's the choice you make. That's what she's done. So sad. So sad. Romans chapter number 3 verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Did you get that? Through faith in his blood. See that? That's not a Baptist thing. That's a Christian thing. Believers in Christ. If you say that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have faith in the blood of Christ. There's no other way. I'm not going to read all these scriptures, a bunch of them. All you, don't, all you have to do is type the word blood in. If, if you get a Bible program or a concordance, when it, whichever one you want to use. Uh, if you're not you know, computer literate, that's fine. Just get a concordance. You've got Strong's, Cruden's, Young. There may be some more. Get a concordance and, and any word, it'll show you every place that word shows up in the Bible. And you can run them down, run the references. But if you do have a Bible program and you type the word blood in, you're going to, it's going to pop up just everywhere. The New Testament and the book of Revelation especially, full of blood. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. For example, in uh, Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having, e having obtained temporary redemption for us all. Y'all caught me, didn't you? What does it say? Having obtained what kind of redemption? Eternal. So you believe in eternal salvation is what the Bible said. The scripture says he became the author of eternal salvation. So... Verse 9, Revelation 5, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You take the blood out and you've taken salvation out. You've gutted the work of Christ. It becomes just simply a matter of morality. The blood's gone. There's no hope and there's no power. There's no salvation. So sad. I want you to listen to this now. You know, you folks have heard me teach in here in Sunday school about Adam. First Adam, last Adam, first man, second man. I got into quite a bit of detail. Listen carefully to these words that I'm going to read for you tonight. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did just that. He was not a little God. He was, he was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. 
He was not subordinate to God. Adam is as much like God as you could get, just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. Now, folks, you know your Bible. You know you just heard a mouthful of heresy. That's pure blasphemy. Now, the people that are pushing this, this, this emerging church movement, that's the kind of doctrine that they're pushing. First of all, God cannot reproduce himself. There is just one God. God did not come into being from everlasting to everlasting. He's God. He is an eternal being. There was never a beginning with him. The Lord Jesus Christ was not created by God the Father. That day never happened. There never was a time when the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, did not exist. The Lord Jesus has always existed. Do you believe that? Forever. There was a time when the God-man came into existence 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea. And that's what Christmas time is all about. That's when God incarnated himself in flesh. But still nothing has changed about the Son of God. He's still eternal. Now he has become a man. All right. Now where in the world do you get the idea that Adam was God manifest in the flesh? He gets it from this. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the last Adam. He's called the second man in 1 Corinthians 15. So he reasons, well, good night. If the Lord Jesus is the last Adam, second man, then the first Adam, and if the Lord Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, then the first Adam had to be God manifest in the flesh too. That's not what that book says. Why? The first, well, for a lot of reasons, but think about what happened to the first Adam. He did what? He sinned and died. He fell. The Lord Jesus did not sin. And he did not die in the sense that you died. He laid his life down. It wasn't taken from him. See, he died, but his life was not taken from him. He said, no man does that. I lay it down of my own free. He had to. He had to. Because he was an eternal living being. And he had to lay his life down. So he did. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the what? Lord from heaven. That answers your question. The Lord Jesus Christ did not originate from this earth. He's the Lord from heaven. Amen. I love his name. I love him. I bless his righteous name tonight. I am so blessed. God has been good to me. If I never see the sun rise again in this world, folks, don't feel sorry for me. God's been good to me. He's been very good to me. My body is at 72 years of age. I'm not just in the last five years. I've noticed a, a, a definite change in my body. And a lot of what's happening to me, no doubt, is a reaction to the medication I'm taking. No doubt. I get extreme fatigue. No doubt. I have a lot of problems physically. But I'm not complaining. God's been good to me. I'm not complaining. God's been good to me. He sure has. And if he takes me out of this world... Before, the, before he comes at the rapture, I'll meet you by the river. Amen. I'll be waiting on you. Amen. I'll meet you by the river. I hope to see you there. Amen. I hope to see you there. We'll sit down by the river <laughs> and we'll listen to that song of the redeemed. Amen. And we'll gather around that eternal being that put us in this world to begin with. Have you found out why you're here? Do you know why you're here? I know you. if you're born again, hallelujah, praise God. But then God's got a reason for you. He's got a call on your life. You know, he wants to use you. What are you here for? What's your place? Father, bless your word. Thank you for your goodness. You've been good to me, Lord. You've been good to me. Hallelujah to your holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Lord, I could just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Bless thy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I hope everybody in here knows you. I hope everybody that's watching this thing right now on you, that, uh, through the streaming ministry, I hope they know you. I hope those that will watch this later do. If they don't, I hope they'll answer the call, and I hope they'll come to you, and I hope they'll believe. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen.